And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of God, or the glory of the Lord, shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard of it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. And it was told unto them, as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was a just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them, and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for the redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. 
and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Again, we're talking today about glory to God and on earth peace. We find in the story the shepherds, the ones that first have that revelation that the Christ child would come. And here the announcement that they have heard comes to them by hands of an angel, which said unto them in verse 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And I love that because you see that in verse 10, and you all see that little word there in verse 31, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. That was Simeon there crying out about the salvation that he had just saw. All people were to receive these good tidings. All people were to receive of this salvation. Salvation. Continuing in verse 11, it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so the shepherds receive this great vision, where they see the angel proclaiming the good tidings that are for all. And as they receive it, they're astonished, and even the more so as there's a great heavenly host crying out, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Verse 20 says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. And so they went forth, proclaiming that good news, proclaiming to all, praising God, giving Him all the glory for all the things which they had saw, which they had beheld with their own eyes. Glory to God. Glory to God. The shepherds had it right. They knew that all glory was belonging unto Him. You can turn to Psalm chapter 86. As you do, I want to read... But it says in Ephesians chapter 1. Now one day at the right hand of God, Christ will no doubt be far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. Again, glory to God for that, that Christ would be prophesied as being far above, far above every principality, far above every power and might and dominion and even every name that is named. Christ getting the proper position there. But here the angels had just revealed unto the shepherds that he would be born in this weak state, lowly, laying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, comforted by his parents, covered, comforted by his mother. Just as any child couldn't feed himself. Just as any child couldn't get about on his own. And yet he would one day be the one that was far above and far above and far above, receiving all glory and all praise. In Psalm chapter 86, I think I'll begin reading at verse 8. Psalm 86 and verse 8, it says, Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and doest wonderful things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to 
fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify thy name forevermore, for great is thy mercy toward me. Thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of vile men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art God full of per full of compassion and gracious long suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth O oh, turn unto me and have mercy upon me give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid show me a token for good that they which hate me shall see it and, sh and be ashamed because thou Lord hast hope in me and comforted me we see God here getting glory among the gods, none like him. We see God here getting glory, all the nations being prophesied, that they would come, they would worship, they would bow down before his holy name. Why? Because he is God alone. He is great. He has done wondrous things. And we see that quite often in scriptures, that it is all the works of God that bring glory unto himself. It is all his ways that reveal that his glory and all glory is due unto his holy name. His works, his ways reveal this. And we are, as we stand here today, oh so blessed to receive even that small sign, even that token for good from him, as it talks about when he says, show me a token for good that they which hate me, they which despise me, they which reject me shall be ashamed. And what was that little token? What was that little blessing that came? Well, that little blessing was that Christ child prophesied laying in a manger. And most of our enemies would behold something so frail, something so weak, something so needy, and say, uh, is that, is that all that you have? Is that your help? Is that, is that what has hope in you and comforted you? Well, yeah, amen. amen. Because that is Christ the Savior, as prophesied in the flesh, God Almighty. Amen. Turn to John chapter 12. See, the thing about our Lord is that he receives, rather it's interesting, he, he retrieves the greatest glory in fulfilling his own purpose and his own plan. This is where God really glorifies himself and lifts himself up. When we talk about the scriptures and how they are preserved and how they are perfect and how they are without fault, we're not talking about scriptures that are just uh, that are just okay. We're not talking about scriptures that are accurate. We're talking about scriptures that are the very words of God, perfectly preserved in all. Every jot and every tittle is what we're referring to. And when we talk about the glorifying of God, one of his greatest acts and miracles is the fact that he will prophesy thousands of years before an event comes to be. That he will reveal himself in a certain way. He will give that token, even as we read in, in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, just for example. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel or God with us. And God reveals that thousands of years before the event actually takes place here in Luke chapter 2. When it takes place, all we can do is give God the glory because he said it and he did it and fulfilled his purpose and his plans. And that's how God retrieves glory unto himself. That's how God receives glory from those that ought to give glory unto him, fulfilling his own purposes and his own plans and revealing them to us as a token before they ever come to fruition. The greatest of all events worthy of glory and praise and honor is when the great God, as we're talking about today, revealed himself, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. When he was born in that manger, when he came to this earth, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son upon that cross, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the reality is, is that God revealed himself first unto these lowly shepherds, first unto these servants of the Most High God that we read about in Luke chapter 2. He revealed himself first unto them as someone low, as someone meek, as someone that couldn't even care for himself, as a babe laying in a manger. The greatest of glories are received from God Almighty becoming God weak in the flesh. Becoming from God Almighty to becoming God that needed to be carried and cared for. The creator of all now being birthed in the same manner that any one of us is birthed. How much humbler can you get? How much lowly can you get? Amen. Our God did that for us. And Emmanuel here 
Though some would look and say, oh, it's just a weak little baby. It's just a weak little child. Emmanuel here was the foundation of our faith. He was the rock of our faith still. He was that chief cornerstone still. Why? Because the word of God is good. And when he says that this babe shall be lifted up on high, this babe shall be far above all principality, this babe shall be far above all power and all might and all dominion, and every name that is named, when he says it, this is as good as done. Amen. In the grand scheme of things and in, and in future to come. He is the foundation. He is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone today. And he was that same laying in a manger. The Lord's redemptive plan for all men is that he would come to this earth and be the savior of all. And this is the glorifying story that we behold in the Bible. This was his whole purpose and plan. Men fell and he just set to work redeeming us. Of course he knew what was going to happen from the end, from the beginning. But when men made their choice to sin and to fall, God was right there redeeming us unto himself. I had to turn to John chapter 12. Look at verse 23. It says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He's glorifying himself in this, in his death. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. What's that mean? That you're, you're trading the life that you have for, for the life that he gives you. You're, you're setting aside my way of getting to wherever my destination is, and you're setting that aside to receive of the life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Let's be someone that serves God and has the Father's honor upon us. Verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this hour came I. He says, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Verse 29, the people therefore that stood by and heard it said, it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, the voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Christ came to this world born of a manger for the express purpose of what's about to be fulfilled. And in doing so, he is glorifying himself. He is glorifying the Father, and the Father acknowledges, I have both glorified your name, Son, and will glorify it again. I will get glory upon this. And when he spoke, men marveled. What was that? And Jesus said, that voice came, not because of me, but that voice came for your sakes, that you could hear and you could give God the proper glory that he deserves. The greatest glory of God is receiving men, redeeming them unto himself, and drawing them through his sacrifice to believe on him and to trust him. And this is what God is setting forth. This is why Jesus is saying, Hey, Father, I'm about to go to the cross. Glorify me. And God acknowledges, I, I have glorified you and will again. John 13 and verse 31. We're talking about God getting all the glory. And the most glorious thing that he did was his plan to save sinful men. John chapter 13 and verse 31 says, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. What's he talking about here? Judas was just at meal with him, at table with him. And again, the word of the Lord was fulfilled as Satan entered into him, and the one that was with him, and the one that had yoked with him, and the one that was, was one of his own familiars, was now setting out to betray him to be crucified. And Jesus said, hey, the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified, and we're glorified together in this very act. John chapter 17, Jesus continues in this vein, talking about receiving glory in his redemptive plans. 
John chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Look, we're getting closer and closer to that hour, and here it is. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Remember that verse? Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward all men. And Christ says, I have glorified thee on the earth. Your peace comes. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which thou, which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. The transfer of glory comes down as God glorifies the Son, and then those that are in Christ, whom God opened the door of salvation to when he set forth the prophecies, when he set forth the events that are about to take place, when he said, whosoever believeth in me should not perish. God opened that door so that as many as have received the word, as it says in verse 8, and have believed that they were that Jesus was sent of the Father. They have believed the promises of old that were made regarding Christ and what was about to happen. The door was open, and now God is going to be glorified in them. Why? Because they have believed, and because his redemptive plan had been fulfilled. When is his redemptive plan fulfilled? When does he get the most glory? When people look and live, my brother live. When they look to Jesus Christ and live, his purposes are fulfilled and he gets glory. He's glorified in receiving us and so he sends peace. And so he sends peace on earth. John chapter 14 and verse 27. John 14 and verse 27. John 14 and verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus brought peace, and he's giving peace, leaving peace to those in these last few moments, telling them that they're going to receive it. In all of this context, he's talking about the Comforter coming and, and the great peace that he would bring. The Bible says, in Philippians chapter 4, you can go there, Philippians chapter 4, and verse 6, talking about that great comfort, or the great, the great spirit that would come, Philippians chapter 4, in verse 6 it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And this is the peace, I believe, that the Spirit comes and brings unto you. This is the Spirit that allows us to feel free within our spirit. Allows us to be uh, unburdened, to be calm, to be cool and relaxed in even the, the biggest struggles, and the biggest turmoils. Okay, the peace of God passeth all understanding and it keeps your hearts and your minds, it keeps your being at peace. And what he's going to exhort here is that we keep and maintain that peace by being right with the Spirit and thinking upon certain things, spiritual things. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Right? This is the same spirit that comes, the comforter, that brings us into all truth and gives us that peace when we can go through turmoil and still feel calm. When we go through troubles and trials and still feel at peace and calm and careful for nothing. 
right? But I don't think this is the peace Jesus is talking about when he says he sends peace on earth, goodwill toward all men. The other peace that I don't believe we're looking at is as, as you, you read on in, in John chapter 13, he talked about how, um, how, how he, he, well, we can go there. Keep your finger approximately Philippians, I believe. Now just go to John. In John chapter 13, we were there before. <clears throat> and Jesus had just said he was glorified in the Son. And then he says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto you, this is verse 33, whither I go, ye cannot come. And now, so now I say to you. Verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, so that ye love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. The next type of peace that I don't believe God is revealing unto us here, when he says peace and goodwill towards all men, is this type of love one for another. While it's wonderful, especially in the context of believers, and while it's even commanded here that there would be love towards all the brethren, we know that sometimes it just doesn't happen. Sometimes men disagree and men argue and men, men whatever. So God isn't promising and on earth peace, goodwill towards all men when he says something like this, you know, that you have love one for another. If you were to look in Matthew chapter 10, go back a few Gospels, Matthew chapter 10, we said that he's not, he's not revealing unto us or sending unto us through Christ the, the peace of mind, that calmness. Now I'm saying he's not sending peace that would have everybody just sing kumbaya and just get along all the time. He's not sending that type of peace in this message. In Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 34, the Bible says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. So we read the prophecy that peace would come. And Jesus here, as he's walking as a man, says, I didn't come to send peace. So is that a contradiction? No, he's talking about different things. Verse 35 says, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. What's he saying? Count the cost. You're following Christ. Be willing to lose it all. Why? Because Jesus, when he enters in and his word enters in, it does not bring peace but a sword. It divides, it cuts, it removes. Even within your own self, the Bible says of the sword of the spirit that divides soul and sunder, right? It divides the joints and marrows and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Even within my own self, there's strife. There's a part of me that wants nothing to do with Christ. And so when the word enters in, it cuts, it removes, it divides, it separates those things. And so how much the more when we're dealing with other people, when we're dealing with our fathers, when we're dealing with our mothers, our daughters-in-law, the man's foes shall be they of their own household. Of course there's going to be division and strife. Jesus didn't come to bring the type of peace that would have everyone in your family, every one of your friends, every one of your co-workers, every religious denomination nation come and unite and just be buddies he didn't come and bring that type of peace Amen. and that's the reality when you're following christ you need to be willing to be at variance one with another because if i'm serving this word with all my heart soul mind strength i'm going to be at variance with my own flesh so of course if i'm convinced and determined to follow the word of god i'm going to have variance with the people that are here today i'm going to have variance with the people who are out in the world at large that will just come. It's inevitable. And so Christ didn't come so that I can get along with every single Roman Catholic and be close with them. He didn't come so that I can get along with every single United Church brethren and just be close with them. He didn't come so that my family would be close with me. My friends would be close with me. He didn't come so that, so that Reformed Baptists would be close to me. He didn't come so that, so that you name the group would be close with me. He came to say variance one to another. There's going to be divisions. There's going to be, there's going to be strife. There's going to be turmoil. Christ didn't come to make those things and set those things a certain way that everyone would just yoke up and get along. If we're following Christ, there's naturally going to be divisions. <clears throat> what did Christ come to do? He came to raise the dead. Christ came to give life unto the lost. 
He came to reconcile us to the God that we never knew nor cared to know. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath and were others. So naturally, we are the children of wrath. Naturally, we were walking in the way, in the course of this world. And it was that man that was quickened. That man that was dead in trespasses and sins, Christ came to raise. Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. And his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. For he, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. In mercy, by his great love, through the extended grace, received by faith, we are his work. Okay? Christ is doing the work, and this is the order that he does it. He extends it to the dead, to those that don't want anything to do with him, to those that have no need for love. And how do they get a hold of him? The word of God enters them. Once they hear the word of God, faith cometh by hearing. When they've heard it, they have the ability to, to, to react with faith and respond with faith unto God. Amen. In mercy, by the great love that he had when he sent his own son, through that extended grace of something that we don't deserve, he opened the doors that we could receive faith when we received that engrafted word, which is able to save our soul. This is what Christ came to do. Verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision, by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So we were once without, and now we're within. We were once aliens and strangers and foreigners but now we are of the commonwealth why by the blood of him by his sacrifice and he gets all the glory for that he's the one that did it he's the one that performed these great works as we were talking about in psalm chapter 86 he's the one as jesus was prophesying and walking towards that cross said that he would be glorifying his father even as his father is glorifying him and in him we too would be glorified by this act once we were without, now we are within. It's all by the blood of Jesus Christ. That Christ child, that token of good that came unto us, the Savior that was born in that manger was, was there to the end that the enmity would be broken down between us and spiritual Israel. That the enmity would be broken down between us and ultimately the Lord God. He is our peace, it says in verse 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity and here's the description here's the definition of the enmity what is it even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace how are we going to receive peace how are we going to have the enmity or the or the or the contrary Rariness, or the fact that we are enemies of God at this time. Why? Because of the law, the commandments contained in ordinances. How are we going to break that down? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Christ had to come and slay 
the enmity. What's the enmity? The law of commandments contained in ordinance. How did he slay them? By keeping them in their fullness, in their entirety. Doing that thing that we couldn't do. He came as a babe in the manger and he lived just like we all live. We even see at the time of 12, there was something very different about this child. He said, he said, you, you know, Mom, I appreciate that you called Joseph my father, but the reality is, is I need to be about my father's business. What was the father's business? To glorify himself and be glorified that we could be glorified. Glory to God and the highest and on earth peace. Goodwill toward all men. He wanted us to have peace. And how did he do that? He is our peace. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained ordinances by slaying them. Reconciling both to God in one body by slaying the law and commandments contained in ordinances, which the Bible describes were contrary unto us. The Bible describes that these laws were our schoolmaster to simply bring us to Christ. He took them out of the way, nailed them to the cross, and so doing so, united both in one. Verse 17 says, And came and preached peace to you that were far off. And how far off were you? When you first heard that gospel message. How far off the, uh, of the righteous path? How far off were the right way of salvation were you? When somebody came and preached that unto you. When the word came to you and spoke to your heart and revealed unto you. Christ came and preached peace unto you which were afar off and to them which were nigh. Who's that? That's Jew and Gentile. That's the whole world. That's everybody. That's all the world. Verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit into the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, who are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's the word of God. That's, that's the King James Bible we have right here for the English speaker. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being that chief cornerstone in whom all the building fairly friend together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We have access, both Jew and Gentile, bond and free, to have access to, everyone now has access to, the revelation of the Word of God, which once it enters in, Right, as it says in verse 20, we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, Jesus dying on the cross, shedding his precious blood to break down the enmity of the law that was having us in transgression against God himself. We have access now in Christ through his redemptive plan. And he gets all the glory for that. And there is no end to that dominion that he has. There is no end to the, to the reign and rule that he has there. Isaiah chapter 9. I can read Isaiah chapter 9 if you want to go to 2 Corinthians 5. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And therefore, who gets glory? It's the zeal of God that is performing this. It is the zeal of God that is birthing that child. It is the zeal of God that is bringing apart that increase of government and peace, which there shall be no end. So how can it be that peace of mind that it's talking about? It can't be. How can it be that peace where we all just get along and sing kumbaya? It can't be. The peace is the breaking down of the enmity so that we can be reconciled unto the Father and in doing so become a part of the government and peace that shall be of no end. The government of peace that is established on the throne of David, ordered by Jesus Christ, established with judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever, and is sealed and pressed forward by the zeal of the Lord of hosts who shall perform it, who shall perform it. Amen. That is the peace that God wants for us. It's, it's, it's giving us access to have peace with him where we once had enmity. It's giving us access to, to overcome the law of commandments and ordinances that was set against us, even though to this day and even every other day, I have fallen short of 
overcoming that law. Because I'm always guilty. I'm always transgressing. I'm always breaking God's law and sinning against him. And even still, I'm an overcomer in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me find it. God always gets the glory in fulfilling his will regardless. Jesus Christ said, we read it in uh, John chapter 14, peace I leave with you, peace I give unto you. We don't have that peace unless it's received. We all agree? Amen? Nobody's going to have the peace of God that, that, that breaks down the law that's condemning them and reunites them with the Lord that bought them unless they receive that peace. He gives it freely to all men, of course. He gave his only begotten son to all men, of course. He gave salvation as a free gift to whosoever will but until we receive it. It's not our peace. God gets the glory, though, in fulfilling his will regardless of our decisions and how they're made. And so, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. This is to every man that walketh the earth. This is to every man that could choose to believe in Jesus Christ and to the saving of their soul. The goodwill comes to them how? When they receive and hear. Hear, then receive of the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So knowing the terror of God, knowing that he deserves all glory and reverence and power and, 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 and everything to be lifted up above every name that is named, and one day will be, knowing the terror of God and that, and that his gift and his peace only comes from believing upon Jesus Christ, we persuade men. Knowing how he is powerful, knowing the terrors that he has awaiting for those that should choose to reject him. We persuade men, the Bible says. And persuading men is taking what we know of God and bringing it unto them. We convince men to receive him even as we have received him. And that peace that comes by having our enmity taken away, by having Jesus Christ shed his perfect precious blood upon that cross by revealing by having the word revealed unto us and believing and accepting by faith even as it enters in we convince men to receive jesus and to receive that same peace that he leaveth unto all those who want it out of that same love wherewith he loved us we take that to the streets we take that to those and this is why this is why when we go and try to reach the lost we're not, we're not going to be more right than somebody at a door. We're not going to try to outsmart them at a door. We're not going to try to convince them with my understanding of, of what is right and what is wrong. No, we're going to them with a tear in the eye, a Bible under the arm, and we're trying to convince them, knowing the terror of the Lord, what the Bible says. We're not trying to inflate our own selves. We're not trying to puff up our own selves. There is good will to all men. We are not trying to go and elevate ourselves at the door and try to make ourselves like we're some good thing, saving all these folks. No, we're lifting up the Lord who deserves all glory and praise because even as we've read today and even as we've had revealed unto us, the glory is to God in the highest and on earth peace, yes, goodwill unto all men. But who gets the glory? He does. Amen. And so we persuade men. We don't try to provoke men to emulate. We don't try to we don't try to convince men. We don't try to coerce men. We don't try to lead them on a way to get some There is nothing magical to your presentation. You are persuading a man. Like Brother Shane said earlier in the, earlier last week. It could be just one verse. And how often does God stump you when you think you got your presentation all lined up? And it's just this one verse that you didn't think of until that moment that ends up convincing them that they are persuaded finally that they need to get saved. God is in the saving business. We're simply taking that goodwill to all men. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And isn't that true? We read that in Ephesians, right? We were all dead in trespasses and sins until that enmity was taken away, until the law of carnal ordinances was taken away, until he nailed those to the cross, shed his precious blood, so that we could be redeemed. And the Bible is just giving a plain truth here. If one died for all, then we're all dead. Do you know what that means? He died for all to save all. Give me a break, you Calvinist weirdos. He died for all to save all. It's damnable heresy to believe like what? Otherwise, 
If you don't believe that Jesus Christ died for all, and I've heard it from these Calvinists, I've heard them time and time again take John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I've seen these losers go to the Greek and say, well, in the original Greek, what it really means is whosoever is believing should not perish but have everlasting life. You've arrested the scriptures, you've lied to yourself, and you've lied to others. The Bible is clear. All, all, all. You can twist John 3.16. All you want to say that God is just saving whosoever he chooses to believe. You can twist that all you want, but you're also going to have to twist the countless times in Luke chapter 2 that we read. Peace, goodwill unto all men. You're going to have to rest the countless times that we read the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. You're going to have to rest more and more and more Bible verses because even the next one says, and then he died, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Who did he die for again here? All. All. That they which live should not live unto themselves, but they should live unto him. This is another verse that goes along with Ephesians chapter 2. That we should walk in the statutes after we believe. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, what? The ministry of reconciliation. Just contained in that little verse in Luke chapter 2. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace. There is the reconciliation and goodwill to all men. And there is the ministry of reconciliation that follows the peace that enters into us when we are no longer at enmity with the living God. And God wants us to go and to show men how to be saved and to reveal unto them the scriptures so that they too can be the new creature where all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's not a testimony of the changed life and the works that follow. Otherwise, otherwise there would be zero sins in my life after I'm saved. There would be zero thoughts in my head that are contrary to the word of God. There would be zero of those things. The all things that are changed, the new creature is the one that was dead and is raised again. And you can't see him and you can't touch him, but he's there simply because I've believed on him. I have trusted in Jesus and he has raised me anew. And that spirit and the flesh that now um, is in me at the same time are contrary the one to another so that you cannot do the things which you are there again is is that meant that a mindset that there is in fact a carnal Christian hey every single day I have to choose whether I'm going to be a spiritual Christian or a carnal Christian in fact I do that every single moment by moment by moment by moment we are bringing good news we are bringing glad tidings we are bringing God glory when we reveal unto people the true scriptures we were all dead. We were all in trespasses and sin. Christ died and became sin for us that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. And that's what it says in verse 19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though... God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled unto God. And we have that same desire when we go out. We pray in God's stead, person at the door. Will you be reconciled to God? We pray in Christ's stead as ambassadors for Christ. Will you be reconciled unto God? Will you believe in him? Will you allow for the enmity to be put away? You're God's enemy right now. The law is condemning you to hell. Put that away. Believe in him and trust in him. And this is what happens when we go door to door to door. We bring good will to all men. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that the greatest gloryful message ever? Isn't there so much glory to God in that message? He made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin. That perfect 
innocent child that was born that remained a perfect and innocent toddler that grew to be a perfect and innocent young adult that grew to be a perfect and innocent man and died on that cross was made there to be sin for us though he knew no sin that holy and precious and perfect Lamb of God died for you that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now we might become righteousness. Now we might do righteousness. We might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And that's why He says it's a new creature. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my purpose. It has nothing to do with my plans, but it has everything to do with God that said so and God that fulfilled it to be so, as He promised. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Find Isaiah chapter 40. And these are just a few of the times where God revealed his promise. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, he says. And how is he going to comfort us? By giving us redemption. Isaiah chapter 40. And in verse 28, it says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increases strength. But they had no power, they had no might, and he increased it. He gave it to them, even as he's done to you when you were saved. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. In your own works, you might be young, you might be strong, you might be nimble and agile. You shall faint and grow weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall ride and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God promising care and protection and oversight to those that are his own. As promised. He's done. Chapter 41. In verse 10 it says... Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. It's what sustains you throughout your days. It's what sustains you in your walk. That is what's going to sustain you when you breathe your last breath. His righteousness. You won't stand before God otherwise. Verse 13 says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee new sharp threshing instruments. And he continues on. God is providing for us himself as the Redeemer, as that Holy One of Israel. Isaiah chapter 44. And in verse 21, Isaiah chapter 44, and verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee, promising Israel of old that we were grafted into, that they could be redeemed by returning unto him. Look and live. Look and live is what he's saying. And your whole nation has rejected me by this time. Look and live unto God your Savior. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And when he comes, he is going to blot out your sins. In fact, even now, just by nature, the fact he promised that your sins are blocked out if you would only believe. Isaiah chapter, where are we now? 45 and in verse 15. 45 and in verse 15. It says, Verily thou art a God that hideth thyself. Verily thou art a God that hideth thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. If you're trusting in idols, if you're trusting in anything else, be made confounded and ashamed. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. There's that dominion that is everlasting that Christ promises. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, ye seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. 
they that have no knowledge, that set up wood of their graven image, and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is none God beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God as there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Where's the glory come? From being in the seed of Israel, from being in Christ, from being with that one that says, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. And it says in verse 24, even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Who is this talking about? It's Christ that was promised to come. It's Christ that was promised to be that Savior, to bring everlasting salvation. He's good with his word. He's good in all points. Amen. Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. And we know this. We heard an amen. God is good. God, God, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Goodwill to all men. We all believe that God has, has given us peace who are saved. We are no longer at enmity with God. He's broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He's given us free course, free access unto the throne room of heaven. He's given us free course and free access just by believing and trusting in his son. We all know this. We need to bring that goodwill to men. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. That bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. I like that it, it, it links there, peace being published and salvation being published. That saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up thy voice, with the voice together they shall sing. For they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. That's where the goodwill comes to all men. We're simply bringing the glad tidings of the fact that God has bore his holy arm. He's lifted up his sleeve to show that he is strong, to show that he has strength, to show that he is a redeemer. And he's shown all nations of that. The whole world has no excuse but to know. And, and, and sadly, most of the world has rejected it, have they not? And yet still the call comes to all people to have beautiful feet, to bring good tidings of glad things, to publish salvation, to publish peace to those that are afar off, to cry out and say, hey, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward all men. He has purposed, he has planned of old, revealed in Isaiah, revealed in Jeremiah, revealed in Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Jonah, Micah, and Nemo, Micah, Sephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi have all revealed the truths of the scriptures. Glory to God they've been revealed. Glory to God they've been fulfilled. Glory to God that peace is available. We need to go and take that forward to whosoever will. Good will to all men. Let them choose. Bring them the good news. Bring them the good will. This is God's purpose and redemptive plan. And this is where he gets the glory is when the redeemed of the Lord say so. When the redeemed of the Lord say so, when we go and we tell others, we've been redeemed and you can be too. That's when God gets glory. And this is our purpose and our plan. In this church, in this life, goodwill to all men, whosoever will. Salvation is available to all. We need to bring it to all. And that's our plan for 2020. We're going to go forward and we're going to bring it to all. Amen. Amen.